All right, hello, can everyone hear me? Am I coming through okay? Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing. Uh oh, all good? All right, thank you, Evanir. Thank you, Ish. All right, welcome back, another week. Uh, we are almost there, another week, another deliverable. If you can believe it, there is not a whole lot of time left in this course. If you are, uh, if you are, you're feeling a little bit fatigued. If you're feeling a little bit tired right now, don't blame you at all. Uh, I think many of us feel that way. Uh, who's who's kind of tired in the chat? Anyone a little bit fatigued? Hopefully, hopefully it's it's kind of the workout style of fatigue where you feel like you've got a lot accomplished and you're you know you're a bit tired because you've been working so hard. You've learned a lot. Um, hopefully it's not like the injury fatigue where you're running and you like sprain your ankle. You're like, ah, this has been awful, right? Yeah, you're starting to feel the grind. Yeah. Well, the good news is if you're starting to feel the grind, you won't have to feel it for that much longer. I'll prove it to you. Let's look at our schedule right here. Here we are. Here's today, okay? Now you are right in the middle of your P3 beta and you're right in the middle of your P3 marketing draft, your first trailer pr uh, production. But really, we only have one more playtest, one more peer playtest that's on the 12th, and then we have two more lectures after today. That's it. We have two more lectures, and uh, because we don't have any lecture on the showcase day, we're going we're gonna to give you that day off so you can finish up your projects, get things submitted, and then prepare for the showcase, which happens at night. All right? But that's it. Can you believe it? Uh, we only have, what, about a, a week and a half? Uh, about two weeks actually from today and you are finished, okay? You're finished with this course. No exams in this course, uh, so you're gonna be free uh, in two Wednesdays from now, okay? So there you go. Hopefully you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, so today, because we have so few lectures left, we really need to get moving on the topics of game and art, uh, uh, games and business, and games and AI, okay? We wanna finish off these three lectures before we run out of lecturing time. We also need to move quickly because these, uh, uh, next Wednesday, on next Wednesday, we're going to watch your trailer drafts and give you feedback. So it's gonna eat up a lot of the day. So let's go ahead and get to it, okay? We got some announcements. Um, if you think about video games, part of the magic of video games is just how much energy and enthusiasm they inspire. Uh, from others. I think Ish, I think we're still streaming. You might want to refresh the page. Um, uh, this is a really good example of this. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip of one of the world's most famous fighting game players, one of the best gamers uh, out there, uh, Daigo Umehara. Uh, we're going to show you a clip of him fighting Sans Undertale. And uh, I want you to watch his reaction to the end of this boss fight right here. His visceral gut reaction. Let's go ahead and watch. So, so, <laughs> right. I, I apologize. I, I probably should have provided a headphone warning, shouldn't I? I remembered in the first section. Um, but it just shows you the enthusiasm, right? You've got this player who's extremely engaged in this fight. And then when this crowd of enemies appear to shoot lasers at him, and he's low on health and he knows it, he just can't help but blurt out, ah, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's just that, uh, that, that level of concentration, that level of investment. Um, you can think of other things that kind of inspire this kind of emotion, like a really good movie, and many things from real life could inspire this level of emotion to come out of a person spontaneously. But they're good company, okay? Video games have a tremendous uh, power as a medium to invest their players, uh, and to, you know, create certain experiences for them, to give them certain emotions at a very, very deep level, okay? 
All right. Yeah, he was right at the end, too. And that just makes ah, a long, hard fight right at the end. Didn't quite make it. Okay, so uh, this is to say that you have tremendous powers as game designers. Uh, and so, you know, keep that in mind, okay? It's part of what makes it so satisfying to be in this medium. Okay, a note on rough deliverables. Uh, it is not uncommon for game teams to be in a pretty tough spot even this late in Project 3. We're about two weeks out from the showcase. And that's pretty scary. But, you know, if, if you are not super happy with where your game currently is, hey, there's still a lot of time left. I'm reminded of games like Red Dead Redemption, games that really came together at the last minute. When that game came out, you could find interviews with the developers who essentially said that the game was a mess, like as early, uh, as late as like three or four months before release. But it all came together. And video games have a strange way of coming together at the end of a project. So don't give up hope. Keep fighting the good fight, and you're going to be okay at the end. All right? I promise. Okay. Uh... Da, 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 da. Ah, here's our weekly uh, shilling for the other game development courses. If you want to keep studying and contributing to video games and 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 uh, and uh, uh, building your abilities, uh, Wolverine Soft Studio, build a game as part of a big team. Get a fantastic bit of por portfolio uh, uh, work on your portfolio. Uh, get experience working on a much bigger team and have something to uh, tell recruiters about. If you want to work in the games industry, this is a not a requirement, but a very, very good idea. Doing the uh, X55 for Wolverine Soft Studio. You can join by going to the Wolverine Soft Discord and telling Amber Renton, okay? Um, no, these do not count as upper levels because they don't have exams, okay? Uh, X499 is your research course. Uh, it allows you to study a, a game dev topic of your choice in depth, and you get course credit for doing that. It's much more relaxed. Both of these are much more relaxed than X494. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can register on this form here if you want to. Okay, and I posted this agenda so you can get to these links right now in the course schedule. Okay, uh, showcase advertising has begun in earnest. Uh, we are now heavily advertising this event across uh, several different mediums. You may have seen some of the email blasts we sent out uh, to all uh, CS undergrads. There are going to be a lot of people at this. Wow, oh, that's a lot. Wait, 85 foot. Oh, this is an old event. Oh, this is an old event. Boo. Don't share this Facebook event. Uh, don't share that one. That is an old event, okay? You can find the event in Piazza, uh, but there are quite a few people who have already signed up to come to this event, and usually, like, an order of magnitude more than what we see signed up end up coming. So anyway, there are going to be a lot of people at this event. Uh, please look forward to it. You're going to have the potential to have a big impact. Uh, and uh, make sure that your friends and family know about this upcoming showcase. Uh, and uh, uh, so they can uh, participate, so that they can see and take pride in the really cool work that you've done. Okay? You deserve it. Um, the Elements of Professionalism guide is now important. Okay? For your P3 beta, you have a new professionalism criterion. It's uh, quite a few points, eight points. And you will get these points if you have the things in the articles, um, the Elements of Professionalism guide. What does that mean? That means you need to have scene transitions, not just a jarring snap to a new scene. Um, and this includes like moments when you die or when you complete a level and stuff like that. Uh, get those transitions in there. Uh, make sure that your camera work is smooth and not uh, jittery. Make sure if you have a 2D game that you've got some form of uh, parallax or at least some stylish elements going on. Uh, da, 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 da. Make sure that you don't have camera jitter as your camera follows your character around. You don't want this on top. That looks awful. Um, you really want this on top down here. If you want to learn how you can achieve this, you can watch this video down here and you can uh, get this Unity package, okay? You'll want to think about your color palettes. Color palettes can make a game look a lot more polished really quickly, and you'll want to make sure that you have audio and sound effects for all the important actions and moments in your game, okay? If you have all these things in there, you're going to get your points, so make sure you do. Okay. Um, by the way, if you're worrying about how do I create a scene transition, you can find some code in the course repo that you can just use, okay? Uh, it is a pretty cool effect. All right, uh, so assignment released P3 marketing draft. Let's talk about that. This is the most interesting kind of unique new assignment that you have for this week. So hopefully you've assigned at least one or maybe even two people to start working on it. Um, the P3 marketing draft is a trailer. Uh, it is a trailer that can only be 45 seconds long. 
uh, and it is meant to showcase your game. You are creating a draft of this trailer, so you want to focus this uh, week on the structure, and then next week we can do things like polish up the voiceover, uh, you know, record faster footage, um, uh, make it more interesting and novel. Okay, this trailer has to has a few. Ha it has to have a few things. It must have a pitch narrated clearly. So you need to have some voice. Ideally, it's someone you find on a voice acting forums who have a clear microphone and a recording booth that they can get your really nice voiceover. Uh, this pitch needs to be something like, in Super Mario Brothers, you play as a plumber, uh, 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 dodging and weaving through action-packed 2D fantasy worlds, collecting power-ups in order to save the kingdom, right? That is your pitch, right? It is, you, 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 um, you include genre, you mention the genre, you mention the setting, you mention a little bit about gameplay, and, uh, and then you need a title card. So this title card needs to be the first thing that anyone sees in your trailer, and it needs to have your game's name, it needs to have each team member, including freelancers that contributed to this game, okay? And that's, uh, that's essentially it, okay? You cannot have any expletives, and I do not want you to beep them out, okay? Don't do that, all right? Okay. So, uh, blah, 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 blah. when it comes to this trailer, I want to talk a little bit more about what is expected for it. So this trailer, this trailer has to have essentially three parts to it. It needs to have a hook that begins the trailer. It needs to have a what, the what, right? What is this game, right? So you hook the players with something interesting. You then spend some time explaining what is this game? What are the game's mechanics? What can you do in it? What are your objectives? Then you end the trailer with something cool, the why, right? Uh, it's kind of like you hook them twice. You hook the audience at the beginning with something weird, and then you hook them again at the end by showing them something super cool or showing them a glimpse of the final boss so that the players, the audience knows that they need to go play this game to find out more, okay? So what I want to do is I'm going to watch, let's, let's watch three trailers that have done this very effectively. And as we watch these, I want you to think about what is the hook here? What is the, the what section? And then what is the, the why? Okay, why should players uh, play the game to learn more? Okay, so let's go ahead and watch. Uh, this is one called Color Wars. It's a very cool kind of neon styled game. Very polished, very fun. Let's take a look. In Color Wars, you must pass before you can score. Steal the ball. Block your opponents. Clear the path. Outplay the enemy. First to three wins the game. Color Wars. All right, so we can see we've got our title card here. It's at the beginning, it's at the end. And if, uh, if you look, did you notice the hook? So we've got the hook here. At the very beginning, we get this powerful music come in, and we also get this really cool shot of gameplay, right? You get to see your opponents explode. You get to see a cool shot to the goal. That is the hook, okay? The team is trying to get the audience excited right away by showing some really cool gameplay footage. Then, about five seconds in, the hook ends, and the team is trying to explain to the audience what mechanics do you have in this game. You can pass, and they sh they zoom in and they show a pass. You can't miss it. They show a uh, steal. They show a, 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 the ball getting stole several times. You can't miss it, right? You can block by putting down this wall. <clears throat> you can, uh, you can uh, help your teammate out, right? So this middle, like, 30 seconds of this trailer is all about showing the audience what you can do in this game. Now that they've got you interested via the hook at the beginning, they show you what are you buying here? What is the product? What is going on? And then at the very end, the why. Why should you care? Why should you follow up? They show you this really cool footage of several passes happening and then a very, uh, very uh, risky goal happening, okay? So they have all three elements, and as a result, they have a really, really great trailer uh, that answers the question of why should you care and explains what you're getting, okay? Let's go ahead and take a look at another trailer.
This one is Breakdown, I believe. Avoid falling to a fiery death while trying to send other players to theirs in this action-packed four-player, five-round free-for-all fight for survival. Encircle other players and watch the platform disintegrate underneath them. Try to avoid conflict and play the edge of the map. Collect power-ups to give yourself a tactical advantage. Dodge hazardous obstacles dropped by passing aliens. In a fight to survive, there are no rules. Battle it out and break it down. All right. So did you see it? Uh-oh. Uh, Galaxy, here we go. My computer's so laggy. Okay, so the very first thing, right? Eh. Okay, if you think about what this trailer does, the very first thing is it hits you with the title guard, but this title guard is really cool. Not only does it show you the name of the game and the people who worked on it, but it also shows you this really cool scene in the background of a flaming planet that looks kind of like the sun, and you also get to see these blocks falling. So that is a hook right there. There's stuff happening. Uh, uh, the player, the, the audience is going to be intrigued right away. The game then hooks the player even further by showing off some gameplay footage. Uh, and it starts talking about, hey, uh, you know, encircle your enemy. Use power-ups to, to stay alive. Avoid hazards dropped by the aliens, right? So it starts with the hook, and then the narrator starts to show off and explain the different aspects of gameplay. Right, so that the audience kind of knows what you know this game is and and whether or not they're interested. The game then ends with this really kind of dramatic uh, match where one player is barely hanging on and then the title card. So we got a little bit of a why there at the end, a second hook. Uh, so it's really really effective. Let's go ahead and watch a one more trailer. We didn't watch this one last time. Uh, let's go ahead and see what it is. It, it might snowball maybe. Fight for Fish, a builder's revolution. Okay, let's go ahead and do it. Here we go. The Fight for Fish, a builder's revolution. Capture the opponent's fish. Are you ready for Flip and Flap versus Bill and Jill? Grab the red fish if you're on the blue team, or grab the blue fish if you're on the red team. This new fortification stage, you fortify your fish with snow blocks. Now, you fight your way to capture the opponent's fish. Stop your opponents. The fight for fish, a builder's revolution. Okay, so, um, gosh. This is very frustrating. Why does YouTube autoplay that quickly? Okay, so um, the game starts out, the trailer starts out with the title card, good, that check that box. And then you get uh, to see some gameplay footage. Um, the hook here comes a little bit later. It says, are you ready for Flip and Flap versus Bill and Jill? We get a, an introduction to the characters, which endears the audience to this game, right? You get to play as characters with this, the kind of funny name, you then get into the what, the middle part of the video, where it's trying to explain what you should do. You are supposed to capture the opposing fish. You are supposed to build out uh, defenses, right? To protect your fish uh, by placing blocks everywhere and kind of blocking off your opponent. Um, you then, it shows some fighting, blah, 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 blah. It shows some fighting, capture the opponent's fish. And then at the end, we get to see, it's, it's not a great hook at the end. It's not a great the why. But you do get to see some neat gameplay footage, uh, and you do get to see the results screen here, okay? Uh, and the title card at the end. So a pretty good trailer. Though I think the, the why at the end could be a little bit stronger. So anyway, how are you feeling, right? Do you have any ideas? Uh, chat, do, do any ideas spring into your head for how you could structure and explain your game in 45 seconds, in three sections? The why, uh, sorry, the, the hook. So something weird, right? The, the, the hook the middle, right, the what, and then the why at the end. Why should people care? Um, the hook is usually the most interesting part. 
the student teams come up with all sorts of ideas for how to make an engaging opening. Um, sometimes they do a little live action skit. So they've, you've got like little humans dressed up and, and you're doing something interesting for five seconds, 10 seconds. Um, uh, sometimes you have a cool little animation or a cutscene that you show at the beginning. Um, there are all sorts of weird, surprising things that you can do. Sometimes a character from the game appears in front of you and talks to you as the audience member. Um, think about something funky and surprising that you can do uh, to get people's attention. Some, some teams decide to make their entire trailer like a musical. Uh, I'll remind you of uh, my favorite, uh, probably my favorite trailer uh, of this course of all time. It, uh, I imagine it was very hard to put together, but it was very, very worth it. And you probably know what I'm talking about. It's impossible not to pay attention to this trailer as soon as you hear the music come in. Come on, let's go. Finish loading. What a slow page. Who programmed this? Okay. Oh no, why did it pause? Anyway, okay, so that's just an example. Um, another example of a really good hook is uh, Yoked. The trailer begins with a phone call. Someone's calling the police, like a scared homeowner is calling the police to tell them about these eggs that have come to life. An extremely, extremely creative way for the video to get people's attention, because it's so abnormal, but also to explain what the objectives of the game are, right? The eggs, I think they're trying to get to the window, right? They've sprouted arms, help, right? It's really cool. You've got a live action example here. Lights out, the story of a small light bulb on a big mission. So um, another thing I'd like to point out is the audio. Uh, all these teams went to opengameart.org, they went to freesound.org, and they found audio tracks, background music, that has the exact tone that they were looking for. Lights Out is a little bit creepy, but not too creepy, right? Uh, Yoked has a very intense song because the eggs are coming to, live in, uh, to life in this person's fridge. It's very spooky, right? Okay, anyway, uh, let's keep going here. We've got a lot to do. I want to go over games as art. <clears throat> it's kind of a big presentation. Has anyone played a, and we'll need some time to get through it. We're gonna play a few games. Has anyone played a game called Papers, Please? Has anyone heard of it? Saturated, you mink says, yep, yep. Papers, Please is a really, if you've played it, then you probably know why it's the first thing you see in the games and art lecture. Um, uh, games are a really unique medium. They are a, a very technological medium uh, and they, they employ a ton of engineers, uh, many of you maybe. Uh, and they also, you know, unlike working on an app, you know, let's say that you graduate and you go to work for the startup who's making an app that allows you to control your laundry. Now, there are going to be some tiny opportunities for you to do artistic stuff, uh, for you to have an artistic message in that app, but there aren't gonna be nearly as many as if you're making a game, right? If you're making a game, you really do have the ability to present the world, whatever world you come up with in an interesting way that might have something to say, right? Okay, let's get on with it. What is art? What does art mean to you? This is something we won't spend a lot of time on because we need to get moving. But when you hear that something is considered art, what comes into your mind? What do you think makes something art? I'm very curious because we always get different answers to this. What do you think? Avenir, what do you think? Saturated Yumik. What, is, uh, what does art mean to you? 
Josh Catman, what do you think? I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy a banana while you type the uh, response. Yeah, it's not really an easy to answer question, is it? It's an, a question that's kind of kind of like the question of what is a game. It's a question that is really kind of interesting to think about, but it's not always super useful, right? Not always super useful. Evanier says it's largely subjective what what you think is art, right? Well. When it comes to you know art and video games, there have been a number of very uh, high-profile people weighing in on this discussion. Does anyone know who this person is? This person is Roger Ebert. Um, Josh Catman says art is the unique and creative expression of ideas. Interesting. So um, Roger Ebert right here is a famous film critic, but he had something to say about video games. Uh, he argued in one of his uh, articles that video games can never be art. And let's put aside the fact that it's very strange that someone who's primarily a film critic probably doesn't play a ton of games, is weighing in so, um, so strongly on the topic of games. But Roger Ebert said video games can never really be art. Uh, another person, high profile, who had something to say on this was uh, the late president of Nintendo, Satoru Iwata. <clears throat> and his essential philosophy... Uh, that you can definitely see at Nintendo is video games are meant to be just one thing. Fun. Fun for everyone. He said this at GDC, though I don't remember which one. And if you go and play Nintendo games, yeah, you'll see this philosophy throughout all of them. Nintendo games tend to focus a lot on gameplay, maybe less so on plot and narrative. And it may be a little bit less so even still in terms of artistic message, what the game seems to be trying to tell you. Um, and so the question, though, is I wonder what these two people would react, how they would react to playing a game like Journey, a game that maybe isn't always all that fun, but certainly seems to have a very, very moving presence to it that allows people uh, to, uh, to, to interface with some emotions that are maybe kind of unusual for playing games. So I would like to show you a few games that try and raise artistic questions uh, through their gameplay, okay? These are games that I don't think many people will find to be fun, but we have to ask ourselves whether fun was really the point, okay? First, we're going to play a game called Passage. And in order to play this game, I have to zoom in in a really weird way here. Otherwise, you won't be able to see it, okay? So let's go ahead and try and play Passage. It's kind of an old game, so uh, we're going to see if it runs for us. Click... <clears throat> Hopefully you'll be able to see it here. Okay, it's trying, it's trying, trying to launch it. Come on, drum roll. Drum roll. Uh-oh, did it just quit? Hmm, I think it, uh, I think it may have just uh, quit on us here. Maybe we can give it another shot. It worked last uh, last uh, session. Ah, here we are. Okay, there we go. So Passage, while I play this game, I want you to think. I want you to think about what the game is trying to do. There are a lot of very subtle things that happen in this game, okay? I think this is going to be too loud. Uh oh, I, I need to turn it down a little bit. Okay. So here we are. We can walk around. <clears throat> can find a friend. Hello. Now we're walking around with our friend. Ah, we're stuck.
Ah, treasure chest. Chat, do you notice anything changing about the characters? And that's that. Okay, that was it. That was it. That was the whole game. And so my question for you is, do you think this game was designed to be fun? <laughs> Yeah, it, it does definitely remind one of the montage from the movie Up. Um, but this game, it, it is not that fun to play, I'll be honest with you. And it doesn't seem like it was designed to be. Uh, there are a lot of moments in this game when you get trapped, you walk really down uh, far south and you get trapped and you have to go all the way back up. You can't quite get through. But there are a lot of very interesting design elements to this game that while they don't seem to be trying to be fun, they are seemingly trying to be something else, okay? Um, so I'll give you a few examples. Did you notice that at the beginning of the game, so you get points for walking rightward. I'm guessing many people noticed this. You get points for walking rightward, but at the beginning of the game, when you're only single, you get one point for moving rightward. However, uh, when you find your friend, you get two points for walking rightward, okay? but. Actually, finding your friend is not an entirely good thing because if you notice, when you go south, which is where all the good treasure chests are, oftentimes you find yourself getting blocked. You can't quite squeeze through the passages uh, if you have two people. Whereas if you were on your own and you skipped your friend at the beginning, then there's a very good chance you would have been able to get through those and get to more treasure. Um, <clears throat> it's a, kind of an interesting thing to notice. Um, you might also notice that it's entirely possible for you to stay near the top of the screen and have a much easier time progressing. 
But if you want all the goodies, if you want all the special rewards, you need to go south, and that's where things get a lot more frustrating, and that's where things can uh, can, can uh, get you blocked, okay? You'll notice that when you die and you have a friend, you actually become hunched over and you move really slowly. It's like you've lost a part of yourself and you can't move very fast. However, if you never get your friend, then this never occurs. You stay fast until your death at the very end of the game. You can technically get further um, if, uh, if you uh, do not link up with someone at the beginning. So there are a lot of analogs you could draw with these design elements, right? Hey, it's totally possible for you to coast through life at the top of the screen and not have to deal with too many worries, but you're not going to have the highest score. For that, you need to go low and you need to um, uh, kind of deal with frustrations and take on a bunch of challenges, navigate your, say, your way through this maze. Um, you can have a lot more opportunities in this game and maybe even in life if you forego a family, right? You have more business opportunities, you have more hours in your day to do things. However, every step in life is going to be maybe a little bit more valuable uh, if you have a friend. So um, there are a lot of different elements of this game that can be analogs for real life. Uh, just the passage of real life, right? Getting older, eventually uh, dying. It's not very fun, is it? So again, ask yourself, was this game meant to be a piece of throwaway entertainment or is it trying to get you to think about something? I think it's very clear that the latter is the case. The next game I'm going to show you is a game called Mainichi, uh, and it's a, a game that is very uncomfortable in many ways, uh, but also very, very powerful. It is a game that puts you in the shoes um, of, uh, of a person named Maddie Bryce, okay? Uh, and hopefully it allows us to build up empathy for her situation. So let's go ahead and play the game and, uh, and, uh, and see how it goes, okay? This is a game called Mainichi, which is a Japanese word for every day. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, looks like I still have a couple of hours before meeting up for coffee. I should probably get started soon. Or I could be lazy and take a nap until then. It's very tempting. I should try being more positive today. Okay, so now we can walk around, we can get ready. Okay. I do have some time to spare. Maybe I can get away with playing video games before I leave. It's been a while since I've had some time for free games. Turn on the PS3. I could use a break. Hehe. <laughs> Hello there, Fenris. Yeah, I would have blown it up too if I was in this place. I'm not sure what game she's talking about. Does anyone know? Pretty sure I have some food in the fridge. Haven't been eating very well lately. Maybe I can sneak in some food before leaving. We'll grab some leftovers. Let's warm this up. Mmm, peach curry chicken. Thank God for slow cookers. I should take a bath before I put on my makeup. I really shouldn't leave the house without makeup. Have to leave soon. Should have thought to bathe earlier. So I can't, uh, I can't, I can't bathe. I can't bathe, I can't put up my makeup. So I've, uh, I've run out of time here. Going to have to go out without doing that. I think I could put on some nicer clothes before I leave. Okay. I should bathe before getting dressed. Interesting, I think we found a soft lock in the game, actually. Because we can't take a bath because we've run out of time, but we can't leave without putting on more clothes. Which we can't do without taking a bath. Okay. Okay, so I think we actually have to restart this. That's unfortunate. Okay, so first thing we'll do is we'll go take a take a bath, and then we'll put on makeup, and then we'll go eat, and that's the order we'll, we'll make it happen, okay? Okay, so we'll, we'll speed run it, okay? 
Okay, so she says right here, I should try being more positive today. So something is clearly weighing on her. Let's go ahead and take a bath. I really shouldn't leave the house without some makeup. Is it time to bath? Yep. God, how is it still cold this time of year? I'll never get used to it. Ooh, that's a good idea for a game. So she's a game designer. She's thought of an idea in her head while um, while taking a shower. Very, very typical. Oh, the water was so warm. It's only coffee with a friend, but I probably should put on my face before leaving. So let's pretty up. Just think of it like painting. Once you start, you can't go back, really. There. I look like me again. Pretty sure I have some food in the fridge. I haven't been eating well lately. Thank God for slow cookers. Looks like it's time to go. Don't want to keep her waiting. Okay, so we'll go ahead and head out. Okay, so now we're walking to the coffee shop. Bunch of people out here. Oh, oh my God, look, is that a boy or a girl? Shh, they'll hear you. But isn't that gross? Mm. What's up, pretty? Hey, slow down, I wanna talk to you. Holy shit, you're a man. That's someone's son. Did you see it? Watch out for that man. Let's get out of here. This is a bad situation. Okay, we made it to the coffee shop. Hey, Maddie. I'm over here. Okay, we'll talk to our friend. Hey there, hun. Do you mind getting me coffee while I finish up this call? You know my favorite. Okay, we'll go ask for coffee. Hello there. Um, Can I get you something? May I have a, a hazelnut latte and a chai? No problem. Paying with cash or card today? Try card. Here you go. Thank you very much, Miss... Er... Mr? Rice? Um, your drink will be at the other end. Okay. Well, let's get our drink. It's that cute barista. We're gonna sneak away. Here's a hazelnut latte and chai up at the bar. Okay. Caffeine delivery. Just in time. You look down. Is everything okay in life? You know, the usual. It's hard to feel happy sometimes. You shouldn't care what other people think of you. Your friends love you and that's all that matters. Thanks. And that is the loop. That is the end of this, uh, this, uh, this branch of my Nietzsche. Now you can actually play through this game multiple times and make different decisions that, that affects the, the situation that you find yourself in. Uh, but this was a game, right? I, I think you can see by now, it's not a comfortable game, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, very uh, kind of, in a way, very depressing. Um, this game was made by Maddie Bryce, who is a, um, a, a transgender woman in San Francisco and also a game designer. Uh, she needed a way to express what her life was like and, and what decisions and situations she got into in a daily basis to her friends. And the way that she decided to do this, the way that she could put her friends into her shoes for a day uh, was to make a game, right? Uh, to help them understand what her life was like. And so here we have a game that is very powerful. It puts you in the shoes of Maddie Bryce and you get to kind of face the challenges that she does every day. Something as simple as choosing to pay with card or, uh, or, uh, or cash can become a, a tough problem uh, when you're in her shoes. And so um, a very, very powerful experience, certainly one that was not made to be fun, but one that was made uh, for a very powerful artistic purpose and, uh, and uh, a very, very interesting game at that. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and show you another game here uh, that is very, very good. 
uh, at uh, giving you a new experience. Um, okay, has anyone played the Stanley Parable? We'll go ahead and uh, zoom out here so everyone can see it. The Stanley Parable. Has anyone played the Stanley Parable? You may not have played my Nietzsche or Passage, but you've probably heard of this game. This game was made by Davy Reedon, uh, who actually uh, was, uh, I worked with his brother at Electronic Arts. I beat him a few times in Smash, which is my uh, claim to fame, I guess. Um, but uh, this is a game that is all about kind of the nature of games itself. itself. Um, it uh, deals with and kind of dissects a bunch of tropes uh, that you see in a ton of games. And ask some interesting questions about kind of, you know, the nature of fate, uh, the nature of free will when your experience has been designed for you by a game designer. Let's go ahead and take a look. Now this game takes a little while to load up, so I'm going to enjoy a banana while, uh, while we go here. What's everyone, uh, what's everyone drinking? What's everyone munching on? I got a banana and I got a, a Zevia tea right here. This is the story of a man named Stanley. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on the keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul rending, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. And then one day, something very peculiar happened. Something that would forever change Stanley something he would never quite forget. He had been at his desk for nearly an hour when he realized that not one single order had arrived on the monitor for him to follow. No one had showed up to give him instructions, call a meeting, or even say hi. Never in all his years at the company had this happened, this complete isolation. Something was very clearly wrong. Shocked, frozen solid, Stanley found himself unable to move for the longest time. But as he came to his wits and regained his senses, he got up from his desk and stepped out of his office. Okay, we are Stanley, and this is the Stanley Parable. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Stanley came to a set of two open doors. He entered the door on his left. Okay. Okay. Left or right, chat? Are we going left or right? Okay, we got one person says left. Any other votes? Okay, we're going left. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. Are we going upstairs or downstairs, chat?
Oh, we're going up. Okay. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Shocked, unraveled, Stanley wondered in disbelief who orchestrated this, what dark secret was being held from him. What he could not have known was that the keypad behind the boss's desk guarded the terrible truth that his boss had been keeping from him. And so the boss had assigned it an extra secret pin number, 28. Four, five. But of course, Stanley couldn't possibly have known this. Yet incredibly, by simply pushing random buttons on the keypad, Stanley happened to input the correct code by sheer luck. Amazing. He stepped into the newly opened passageway. Okay, our story is progressing. Descending deeper into the building, Stanley realized he felt a bit peculiar. It was a stirring of emotion in his chest, as though he felt more free to think for himself, to question the nature of his job. Why did he feel this now, when for years it had never occurred to him? This question would not go unanswered for long. Stanley walked straight ahead through the large door that read Mind Control Facility. Okay, are we going into the mind control facility or uh, are, are we taking a left? We've got one for into the facility. We've got one, two for in for the facility, two, three for in. All right, let's go. The lights rose on an enormous room packed with television screens. What horrible secret did this place hold, Stanley thought to himself. Did he have the strength to find out? Now the monitors jumped to life, their true nature revealed. Each bore the number of an employee in the building, Stanley's co-workers. The lives of so many individuals reduced to images on a screen, and Stanley, one of them, eternally monitored in this place where freedom meant nothing. This mind control facility, it was too horrible to believe. It couldn't be true. Had Stanley really been under someone's control all this time? Was this the only reason he was happy with his boring job? That his emotions had been manipulated to accept it blindly? No, he refused to believe it. He couldn't accept it. His own life in someone else's control? Never! It was unthinkable, wasn't it? Was it even possible? Had he truly spent his entire life utterly blind to the world? But here was the proof, the heart of the operation. Controls labeled with emotions, happy or sad or content, walking, eating, working, all of it monitored and commanded from this very place. And as the cold reality of his past began to sink in, Stanley decided that this machinery would never again exert its terrible power over another human life. For he would dismantle the controls once and for all. Okay, uh, do I turn on the, uh, do I turn on the mind control or turn it off?
On or off, chat? Place your bets. Place your bets. We got on. We got one vote for on. We got two votes for on. Uh-oh. I don't know if the narrator is going to be very happy about this. All right. There we go. Oh, Stanley. You didn't just activate the controls, did you? After they kept you enslaved all these years, you go and you try to take control of the machine for yourself. Is that what you wanted? Control? Oh, Stanley, I applaud your effort, I really do. But you need to understand, there's only so much that machine can do. You were supposed to let it go, turn the controls off, and leave. If you want to throw my story off track, you're going to have to do much better than that. I'm afraid you don't have nearly the power you think you do. For example, and I believe you'll find this pertinent, Stanley suddenly realized he had just initiated the network's emergency detonation system. In the event that this machine is activated without proper DNA identification, nuclear detonators are set to explode, eliminating the entire complex. How long until detonation then? Mm, let's say um, two minutes. Ah, now this is makes things a little more fun, isn't it, Stanley? It's your time to shine. You are the star. It's your story now. Shape it to your heart's desires. Oh, this is much better than what I had in mind. What a shame we have so little time left to enjoy it. Mere moments until the bomb goes off. But what precious moments each one of them is. More time to talk about you, about me, where we're going. What all this means, I barely know where to start. What's that? You'd like to know where your co-workers are? A moment of solace before you're obliterated? All right, I'm in a good mood. You're gonna die anyway. I'll tell you exactly what happened to them. I erased them. I turned off the machine, I set you free. Of course, that was merely in this instance of the story. Sometimes when I tell it, I simply let you sit there in your office forever, pushing buttons endlessly and then dying alone. Other times, I let the office sink into the ground, swallowing everyone inside, or I let it burn to a crisp. I have to say this, though. This version of events has been rather amusing. Watching you try to make sense of everything and take back the control wrested away from you, it's quite rich. I almost hate to see it go. But I'm sure whatever I come up with on the next go-around will be even better. My goodness, only 34 seconds left. But I'm enjoying this so much. You know what? To hell with it. I'm going to put some extra time on the clock. Why not? These are precious additional seconds, Stan. Time doesn't grow on the trees. Oh dear me, what's the matter, Stanley? Is it that you have no idea where you're going or what you're supposed to be doing right now? Or did you just assume when you saw that timer that something in this room was capable of turning it off? I mean, look at you. Running from button to button, screen to screen, clicking on every little thing in this room. These numbered buttons, no, these colored ones. Or maybe this big red button, or this door. Everything, anything, something here will save me. Why would you think that, Stanley? That this video game can be beaten? One solved? Do you have any idea what your purpose in this place is? <laughs> Stanley, you're in for quite a disappointment. But here's a spoiler for you. That timer isn't a catalyst to keep the action moving along. It's just seconds ticking away to your death. You're only still playing instead of watching a cutscene because I want to watch you for every moment that you're powerless to see you made humble. This is not a challenge, it's a tragedy. You wanted to control this world, that's fine. But I'm going to destroy it first, so you can't. Take a look at the clock, Stanley. That's 30 seconds you have left to struggle. 30 seconds until a big boom and then nothing. No ending here, just you being blown to pieces. Will you cling desperately to your frail life, or will you let it go peacefully? Another choice? Make it count. Or don't. It's all the same to me. All a part of the joke. And believe me, I will be laughing at every second of your inevitable life from the moment we fade in until the moment I say, happily ever up. Boom. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was one possible ending of about 30. 
And the endings in this game uh, change based on the choices that you make. In fact, in the first section, we got a very, very different ending. Um, I, uh, I'm guessing many of you uh, have played this game and like this particular ending. Uh, and, uh, and that's why you kind of led us there. Uh, but uh, here's another ending. You want to see another ending? I'm just going to close the door. Oh. Oh, that's a bug. That's supposed to trigger an ending, but it didn't. Anyway. Alright, yeah, the narrator, the narrator can be extremely supportive and also extremely bitter. And the narrator can talk to you about um, game design elements if you do certain endings. He can be incredulous, he can be very, like, exasperated and defeated. Um, it's really, really, really interesting. Here we go. But Stanley simply couldn't handle the pressure. What if he had to make a decision? What if a crucial outcome fell under his responsibility? He had never been trained for that. No. This couldn't go any way except badly. The thing to do now, Stanley thought to himself, is to wait. Nothing will hurt me. Nothing will break me. In here I can be happy forever. I will be happy. Stanley waited. Hours passed. Then days. Had years gone by? He no longer had the ability to tell. But the one thing he knew for sure beyond any doubt was that if he waited long enough, the answers would come. Eventually, someday, they would arrive. Soon, very soon now, this will end. He will be spoken to. He will be told what to do. Now it's just a little bit closer. Now it's even closer. Here it comes. Anyway, if you recall our first uh, ending that we got, uh, the narrator says some interesting stuff. He, uh, he changes the story midway through it. Uh, he says that, oh, that off button, sorry, the on button you just pressed, it's actually a nuclear you know, detonation button. And you know, he comments on how games will typically, when they put a big timer on the screen, there's typically a way to beat a game. But this game does not have a way to survive that. You cannot survive that, that nuclear blast. Uh, and he comments on the fact that you're running around pressing buttons that look like they will save you, but in reality, he's just messing with you. Um, there are a lot of interesting endings in this game and a lot of back and forth with the narrator on the topic of free will, uh, predestination, um, you know, what is it like to be a game character inside of a game that was designed by someone else, right? So in a, in a sense, you really are very limited in what control you have. And uh, it's a game with a, a lot of creativity. This game will take you to some places that you would never expect. Um, so uh, I think it's like 10 to $15. It's, it's not super expensive. If, if this kind of thing seems interesting to you, if you want to know what happens when you take a right at the first set of two doors instead of a left, then there are many things that can happen, um, then I encourage you to check out this game. It's a very, very surprising and subver uh, subversive game with a lot to say, if only you look. Okay? So, all right, we've made it to about 3.40. I want to take our five-minute break, and then we're going to come back, and we will finish up this lecture, okay? We'll finish up the, uh, we'll take a look at a couple other games, and then we will start on our games and business lecture, okay? So see you then. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'll answer them. I'm going to step out for just a sec. I'll be back in a second.
Okay, we're back. So let's go ahead and look at a couple more games. <clears throat> the next one I want to look at is a game called Pond. Uh, this is a, a beautiful artistic game with a very deep message. Uh, and so let's go ahead and take a look at it. This is a game in which you walk from left to right automatically, and you are only in charge of the breathing of this main character. You press the space bar to begin breathing. <gasps> And then when all the little balls get to you, the little air particles get into you, uh, you release the space bar to uh, breathe out, right? And you just do that repeatedly, and uh, you know you enjoy calmness. Uh, let's let's go ahead and watch a video. You can't really. It's hard to play this game because it was a flash game, and flash is uh, is kind of in trouble. Um. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and watch the game here. Okay. Very peaceful. Oh, we got a little bit of lag. There we go. Are you feeling the artistry, everyone? Okay, so this, uh, a little bit of context, this game begins with a lot of writing that is very, very overwritten, uh, and the game itself appears to be designed to look like an artistic game uh, that is trying too hard to be artistic, whatever that means, um, and at the end of the game, it decides to throw that in the trash, and it introduces 
fighting game style health bars, quick time events, right? Uh, it uh, a Final Fantasy finishing moves with a meteor flying down, a referee like from Punch Out with a totally different art style coming up and telling you what to do. It is um, uh, it is deliberately shoving as many video game tropes as it seems to be able to into that final part. Um, and the overall kind of sense is that it's making fun of games that try too hard to be artistic for the sake of being artistic. And by doing so, it becomes uh, one of the best examples of an artsy game that has a message. Uh, the message being, okay, don't try so hard to be artistic. Okay, all right. Uh, so let's keep going. Uh, there's another game here that I would like to show you. It's a game called Can Your Pet, uh, and it is a uh, it is a one it is a really heartwarming game. Uh, gameplay commentary. <clears throat> Yes, absolutely modern art. So now we have this game called Can Your Pet. It is it is also a flash game, so we're have to gonna have to watch it. Okay, here it is. And it is a game in which you get to create uh, your own pet, and it's a little chick, and you get to customize what it looks like, and you get to play with it, play ball with it, you get to shower it, feed it, take care of it. So very very heartwarming. I like the tiny glasses on the nose. Adorable. We can improve our, our pet's hygiene. We can feed it. Pretty soon we'll be able to play ball with it. All right, so we're playing catch with the uh, with our with our pet. Very cute. Got a little bicycle down there. Oh, it's so cute. Johnny, yeah? When was the first time you heard a naughty word? First time I heard a naughty word was when I was a child. I heard it from the chickens, me granny she went wild. Me granny says, no Johnny, the chickens had on course. Be says I to granny, twas the chicken said it first. Now this is chicken talk. And this is what they say when the chickens say do Then up the yard, my granny came and left an awful shout. She says to me, no, John, can you your pet. Ah! The <laughs> there you go, can your pet. Um, so yeah, after I play Pond, you have to be a little bit suspicious of what I'm going to show you next. Um, but this is another game that that is really, really effective at setting you up with a certain emotion and then using the contrast between that and what they actually want you to feel. Uh, to really just heighten the impact. So this game would not be nearly as effective at 
uh, you know, shocking you and making you feel maybe even a little bit sick or disgusted if you didn't, you know, dress up your chick and play with it and um, give it a shower and food and play ball with it. And then, oops, you click on the bicycle icon, but it's actually the icon that kills it. Um, it is a very, very uh, impactful game. I, I think it probably scarred a lot of poor little kids. And uh, the artistic message is pretty clear, right? Uh, this is uh, you know, this is the fate of, uh, of a lot of cute little animals. You, you know, uh, so there you go. Okay, um, so let's uh, let's move on to a little bit of uh, happier material. Um, uh, Let's talk not necessarily about artistic messages, but let's also talk about really unique and artistic gameplay. Uh, so experimental gameplay. Uh, Braid is a game we've seen a few times here. Uh, the game, especially in the very last part of it, uh, does a lot of really cool stuff with time uh, that can, you know, the way that it chooses to limit you can create up interesting gameplay situations, but the entire game works together to provide kind of an artistic message as well about the manipulation of time and about perspective. Uh, look at the final level of this game if you want a, a taste of that. Um, there is a game out there called One Single Life, which is a mobile game, I believe. And it is a game in which you are part, kind of a parkour guy and you're jumping across these buildings. But as the name would entail, you only have one life in this game and you don't get to restart or continue or do anything like that. As soon as you die in this game, uh, you are dead. As in the game is not going to let you play it again ever, okay? And it does some stuff to your hard disk to try and persist across installs as well. So yeah, very scary game, uh, but very very interesting and very experimental and cool. Makes you makes the entire game feel a little bit different when you know you can you cannot keep playing if you mess up. Papers Please. Papers Please is a, a really really impactful game. It was the very first game that we showed during this lecture. It is a game about essentially you are you're a border guard uh, for some East Asian sorry not East Asian for some East European countries during a very tough time in their history uh, their fictional countries and you are supposed to choose whether people come in or have to stay out you look at their credentials you look at the um, the uh, papers that they provide. And you kind of check them, make sure that they're not out of date, they're not expired, and then you choose whether to let them in or not. Um, you can play it by the book. Uh, however, sometimes, you know, there are terrorists at the border who will blow up parts of the border, and it causes a bad situation for you. Sometimes there are people who are trying to get into the country, and their papers aren't perfect, but they tell you that they'll be killed if they can't get in and escape their, um, their pursuers. So... You have to make the moral judgment of, okay, do I let this person in, but they don't quite have the papers right? Um, if I get it wrong, you know, I'm going to lose money and then I can't, you know, can I afford food for my family? Can I afford medicine when some of them get sick? Um, it is really, really, uh, it's really tough. So anyway, a very, very cool game. Uh, gameplay really making uh, the artistic message pretty clear. Um, so early on in this lecture, you saw, uh, heard from two people who kind of, you know, weren't very interested in games being an art, a uh, medium for artistic expression. You had Roger Ebert saying something that makes no sense at all, but he still can say it. Uh, you have Satoru Iwata focusing on fun uh, rather than, you know, some larger artistic purpose, and that's fine. Um, there is a question, though, of should games be considered art? And while that's kind of, uh, in my opinion, a bit of a ridiculous question, we have uh, a legal precedent here. Uh, there was actually a uh, Supreme Court case, Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association. And um, this is a uh, Supreme Court case in which it was decided seven to two that yes, indeed, games should be considered art and expression. Um, the context of the case was that there were senators in California, uh, Leland Yee, I believe. Uh, I believe he's now in federal prison. That's an aside though. Uh, he, uh, the legislatures, the legislators wanted to ban violent video games from being purchased by uh, uh, kids, essentially. Uh, and what's interesting here is that there was already a rating system that was uh, there to block kids from being able to purchase games that were um, uh, mature, right? So if you're a 12 year old kid and you go to GameStop and you try and buy a game rated M, like Grand Theft Auto, Assassin's Creed, or Red Dead. 
you are going to be blocked from doing that. But not always. Some shadier institutions would uh, sell you the game anyway. Anyway, the question came down to, okay, uh, is our games considered free speech? Are they considered art? Because in the United States, the government at all levels are restricted from uh, restricting uh, certain things. And one of those is uh, free expression. And so it was decided that yes, seven to two games are definitely speech and art. And so the, um, the ESRB was, is currently the only thing that prevents people from playing games today. There's, it's not illegal to sell a game to a, a kid, a violent game to a kid. Anyway, all right, games are art. That's the legal uh, thought anyway. So why is this important, right? Why do we care about games and artistic ex expression? You are all engineers. You've had four years of college and uh, you've been programming a lot. You've had a lot of impact that way, but in a real, very real sense, right? With the way that you've been managing your time, trying to allocate resources in an effective way, you're also producers. You're also designers, of course, and you're also definitely artists. What you choose to put in your game is going to have an impact on the people who play it. And so you have a lot of power here. Uh, you can put things in your game that make people think, that make people think about their, their world around them or their habits or whatever you want them to think about. And that is uh, the purpose of artistic expression. So anyway, think about this. Not only are you making a game, but you're making a game to help people think about what. Um, you don't need to have a powerful artistic expression, but one will almost inevitably seep into your game just through the act of you making it and your background and your biases uh, and your interests uh, going into your game. Okay? All right. Games and art, a very, very fun topic. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to get a head start on the business analysis tools uh, document, essentially games and business, um, as we really need to move. Uh, next week on Wednesday, we are going to be watching your trailers. And that's going to eat up a lot of our time to finish this stuff up. So let's go ahead and get to it. Who has seen these before? Pokemon cards. Does anyone have any experience with these? Pokemon cards, Pokemon cards, Pokemon cards. I used to be crazy about these things. Uh, when I was like, I think eight or nine, uh, I was, uh, I remember very succinctly, I was at my grandparents' house and it was, it was kind of in the boonies. We didn't have a grocery store around uh, or a market. But what we did have was a debate shop. So we would go down to the bait shop and even the bait shop, which is usually selling lures and worms and uh, bait for fishing, even they had Pokemon cards ready to sell us there. And so, and so I would, uh, we would buy a, a pack of Pokemon cards and it was very interesting. If you don't know what these are, there's a, a trading card game, right? Pokemon is not only a video game, but it's also a card game. And in order to play the card game, you had to actually purchase a pack to get the Pokemon cards that you'd use to play, build your deck. Well, not all cards are made equal, and so you could open up a pack here, and maybe there are a couple cards that you really like and that you can use to improve your deck, but maybe a bunch of cards aren't that useful. You like the artwork, but it's, you know, it's just not useful. So guess what you have to do? You have to pay more money to buy another deck of cards, hope you get a couple rare, you know, super powerful ones. You could almost call it a pay-to-win uh, 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 situation. What's interesting, though, is that as much uh, as much fury, wait, not for fury, as much fury and anger as pay-to-win schemes uh, uh, get these days. Back in these days, uh, the days of the Pokemon cards, it was kind of like kids loved to go out and buy Pokemon cards. Right, um, And so what is the difference, I wonder, between the Pokemon card packs of the old day and the loot boxes that we have these days? Okay, in the news, right, a lot of interesting business stuff is happening. Have you noticed these days that just about every single uh, company that makes games seems to have its own store, right? Mm -hmm. So Steam is very popular for getting games on, but did you know that Epic has its own store? It's the Epic Games Store, right? Did you know that Discord has its very own store? Not very many people use it, and it I think it might have been shut down. Um, uh, Bethesda, if you want to play a Bethesda game, you want to play Fallout, they have their own little store, when, their own little launcher, where you can see um, all the other games uh, that you have and uh, stuff like that. Um, there's even uh, EA that has their own origin store. 
Every company seems to want to have their own store these days. Stardock and Plymouth and Playroom and Kalamazoo even have their own little launcher stores where you want to play their game, but before you can play their game, you have to see this big list of all the other games that are available to you that they make. It's really, really interesting. So the times are changing. A lot of interesting business model stuff has been going on these days. And the question is, why are these changes happening and can we predict what will happen next? Back in the day, when you completed a hard section of a game, a dungeon, let's say, you would get a reward, usually. Games are very good at doling out rewards to you to keep you playing. Now, back in the day, it would look like this. You get to the end of a dungeon, and this is what you see. Ba 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 ba! So you get to this treasure chest, it contains, you know, you, you play hard, you study the game to get to that point, and then you get a really cool new power-up. And, um, you know, you use that power-up and have an instant impact on the stages you, you now face. These days, it's a little bit different. You don't necessarily always have to play the game to get those rewards. Instead, sometimes you can pay the game to get them. So here is someone opening treasure chests, but it's not Legend of Zelda, it is Overwatch. And he didn't play the game for a long time to get these packages, he actually just bought them. He gave the game like 30 bucks or something. We're on the PC here because I don't have any of the skins, or really any skins at all, on PC. And we don't even begin with any kind of skins. I mean, we get, what, Winston, Ferris. guys. No, 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 no full hearts, no nothing. So we have the 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 2020 summer games items in these 121 loot boxes. So we have a lot to get through. <laughs> We're not going to be wasting much time looking at the sprays or the voice lines. If you're wondering what the items are, you can go look at my last video or last year's video because I looked at every single one of these items. Because when you're getting stuff like this, it don't matter. So, yeah, you open up one of these chests and you get a random collection of items. Not something that's been hand-designed to be useful to you, but just a random assortment of items. Uh, in this case, you got something valuable, a uh, skin. However, there are other things you can get, like vocal lines, decals, um, stuff that may be less valuable to you. In many ways, it's very similar to the Pokemon card system, right? All right, come on, keep her going, keep her going. No, nothing. All right, this is not starting off well. See So, just like Pokemon cards, if you open up a pack and you don't get something you really want, and you know it's still out there, then you have to buy another pack, okay? Um, and so, yeah, these are called loot boxes, and they're in all sorts of games these days. Overwatch up here, but down here is... Star Wars Battlefront 2, okay? Which many of you may have heard of for a certain reason. These are called loot boxes. They are little prizes you get, often by playing the game, but usually they're balanced so that you really need to eventually pay uh, to open these, okay? These loot boxes, according to EA, are meant to provide a sense of pride and accomplishment, right? Because you earn the loot box by playing the game, and then in the loot box you might get something that you want. In reality, however, uh, many games are balanced so that you can't get loot boxes very fast by playing and you're heavily encouraged to pay uh, to get the loot boxes faster so that you can get an edge on your opponents. This is the most downvoted comment in Reddit history. Um, uh, essentially, someone asked, you know, why I, I paid money to buy Star Wars Battlefront 2. Why do I need to pay, to, to, to pay money? You know, why do I need to get these loot boxes in order to play as Darth Vader? I bought the game, I want to play as Vader. What's the problem here? Uh, EA said the, the, the reason e, uh, Vader is kind of hidden behind loot boxes is that they want to provide a sense of pride and accomplishment. Which couldn't be further from the truth. Everyone saw that uh, through that. The objective is to put valuable things behind a paywall so that you will pay money in order to get these cool things after you've already paid money for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the, the game itself. And a lot of people are not very happy with that. Okay? It became the most uh, downvoted comment on Reddit ever. Very impressive. Okay, um, by the way, uh, I, I want to shout out EA. Uh, favorite company I've ever worked for. Very good to their employees, at least on my team they were, uh, even though their consumer practices are not always the best. Okay, so the more interesting question, though, is we know what loot boxes are, and we know they're here, but why are they here? Why, what caused them to appear and become such a presence in AAA gaming? I want to plant a seed in your head, okay, that might answer this down the road. Over here on the left, we have a group of games. Overwatch by Activision, a third-party studio. Shadow of War by Warner Brothers, a third-party studio. And Battlefront 2 
a game by EA, which is a third-party studio. Over on the right, we have Microsoft's first-party studios, Sea of Thieves. We have Horizon Zero Dawn, which is a first-party studio, and Super Mario Odyssey, a first-party studio. Right? Nintendo and Sony, those latter two. Over here on the left, these games have loot boxes, they have paid DLC, they have microtransactions. On the right, we have games that do not have any microtransactions. I think Sea of Thieves did for a little while. And so the question is, why do these first-party games have no microtransactions and these third-party games do? Okay, we'll discover why in just a bit. Okay, so here is Steam, okay? This is a digital distribution platform, one of the largest for PC games. Now, what is this? Has anyone seen this before? This, so we can speed up a little bit, this is Origin. This is Electronic Arts' rival to Steam. It is a digital distribution platform uh, that is created by EA, not Valve. Okay? And the question is, why did EA go through the trouble of creating Origin? Electronic Arts used to release their game on Steam, and now they release them mainly through Origin. So the question is, why did they go through that massive expense to create a new platform, advertise it, um, when they could just release game, games on Steam? What's the problem? So these questions that we've, we've gone over the last few slides, why did loot boxes appear? You know, why did EA create Origin? Why is GameStop in freefall? This was more true before the short squeeze um, of, uh, of last semester, but their stock had been going down very predictably to zero before then. These questions are really important. They impact us as players and uh, game developers and the wider industry and everyone in it. So we want to be able to answer these questions. We want to be able to understand how businesses work because they're so large and so impactful these days. Um, and so we have some tools for doing this very, very easily and very quickly. Okay, Two tools. One, the ecosystem map. And two, the value chain. We'll get to the value chain next week. Okay. This week, though, we're going over the ecosystem map. Now, this is knowledge that I first discovered uh, by taking Dr. Aaron Crumb's uh, course on entrepreneurship uh, here at the University of Michigan. We have a number one center for entrepreneurship in the nation. Uh, and so I encourage you to, if you have some spare credits, uh, slot in your schedule, uh, take some entrepreneurial courses. They're a lot of fun. Okay, ecosystem map. Who has a printer? Does anyone have a printer? These printers are really, really interesting products, aren't they? They are, if you think about them, they, they can cause a lot of pain because they get jammed and they require a lot of ink. But if you think about these devices, they really are some of the more impressive technological products that you'll find in, in an average person's home, right? They have uh, touch screens, right? Not simple. They have the task of taking digital information and putting them into a physical real world medium, and that is not easy. These devices need instrumentation for printing and applying ink to a piece of paper. They need to be able to move that piece of paper throughout the printer. So they need like complicated uh, mechanical actuators to move the paper around. The paper's really thin, so it's hard to do. Um, they have uh, parts of their system that is dedicated to kind of housing and maintaining the ink supply. They have a scanner often, which requires some interesting optics. Um, there is a ton of stuff going on in this device. So how on earth is it so cheap? This device, I almost guarantee you, costs a lot more uh, to create uh, than $99, okay? There's a lot of fancy stuff going on inside these devices. So the question might start to reveal itself, right? How these incredibly impressive devices can be 99 bucks? I mean, that's like, that's a little bit more than the price of a video game, right? But then you look at the ink, okay? The ink, the ink, all right? Many of you probably knew we were going here. The ink, $34 for a small pack of black ink, black and white ink. If you want color, ooh, you're gonna pay 70, okay? You're gonna pay 70 for a pretty small pack of uh, a few different colors. That is a ton. In fact, the $70 cartridge is almost the price of the uh, entire machine itself. Now, I actually looked this up. This ink, right, this carton of black and white ink cost about three cents to create. Three cents, 
okay, to get the ink, to create the ink that goes in this package. The package itself costs more than the actual contents inside of it and the shipping. So the question is, why on earth is this the case, okay? Why on earth is ink $34 and how has the price stayed up here when the underlying product, its value is so low? And the question can be answered with an ecosystem map. An ecosystem map is a simple drawing, essentially, that places some sort of product in, in the center of, the, uh, of our little space here. And then we simply draw all the ways that that product can get value from the user, okay? Here's an example. Let's say you get a printer, okay? You have an Epson Workforce printer. Well, that printer has a cost, the hardware that the user pays, $99, okay? $99 go to the company when you sell this printer. However, that's not the end of the story, okay? Because this company will go out of business if it can't get enough money to cover the cost of production at least. And so $99 isn't gonna cut it. It has to find a way to get more value from users interacting with the product. So we have another way that the company gets value from the product. That is not the hardware, but the ink, okay? That's 30 to $60. And what's interesting is that as opposed to the hardware, which is a one-time purchase, this 30 to $60 is predictable. Every three months or so, you're gonna have to pay it if you're printing pretty much at all. What's also interesting is that these ink cartridges have an expiration. They don't last forever, right? Ink dries up. And so um, this is a pretty reliable, pretty predictable, you know, 30, 60 bucks per every three months. And that adds up quickly. And within a, a year or two of the person owning the printer, the printer has paid itself back and more, okay? And so that's the magic of the ecosystem map. It helps us understand how a company can be viable and how the company interacts with their users. This is a particularly evil example though, okay? Because as, as it turns out, if any way, if, if there's any possible way for um, non-Epson ink to be used, then they will fight tooth and nail to prevent this from happening because their ecosystem falls apart if suddenly people aren't paying 30 to 60 bucks every three months to be able to print, okay? There are tons of news stories like this. Someone discovers a way to make printers work with cheap third-party ink. And the printer companies fight tooth and nail legally and technologically to make this as hard as possible because they know they're, they're finished, they're dead, if, uh, if it ever becomes possible to get cheap ink. If it becomes possible to get cheap ink, then the price of the hardware needs to go up to like 300, 400 bucks, okay? And that's not gonna work. So um, this is a really evil example, right? It's, it's Many people see this as abusive. I can uh, totally understand that, right? Paying 34 bucks for something that probably costs like three cents is not a good feeling. Um, there are other ecosystem maps I'm gonna show you. Ecosystem maps for your phone, eco ecosystem maps for video games, that I think most people are gonna agree are a lot less abusive and are much more about, hey, here are the different ways that the company can provide value to users and the users are happy to pay that cost to get those good services, okay? Um, so we'll look at some more examples of ecosystem maps next time. And uh, I, I, th I, I really enjoy this lecture. I enjoy thinking about how all these different uh, ecosystems exist uh, around us. It's something you don't think about a lot of, but think about this. If you got rid of the Epson workforce printer in the center here and replaced it with the Apple iPhone, okay? If it's an Apple iPhone in here or a OnePlus phone, how are all the different ways that Apple gets a little bit of money from you when you were in the Apple ecosystem? What are all the different ways? Is it just that initial purchase? Or maybe you got uh, you got the, the the iCloud subscription for uh, you know two ninety nine a month. Uh, maybe you've got the Apple Music subscription for you know five dollars a month. You know this starts to add up. So anyway, it's pretty interesting to think about. Okay, so we're gonna see you next time. Uh, that's all for today. Uh, I'm going to stick around for a few minutes to answer any questions. Usually we don't have too many, uh, but we will see you then. Okay. Good luck. Good luck on this next deliverable. You're almost there, hang tough. If you feel fatigued, if you feel like you're having a tough time allocating work, uh, if you're having a tough time uh, finding the discipline to hang in there, 
schedule some team work sessions, you know, schedule a nice two hour, three hour block at the, in the evening or something, hop into a discord room, all of you and just work together. Okay. Uh, kind of like having a workout buddy, uh, you will uh, find that discipline is much easier to come up with and, 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 and find when there's another person involved who depends on you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. I'll turn some music back on. If anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and ask them. Anyone know what this song is? This is Katamari, a very, very unique and interesting game. Take care, Ish. Thank you. All right, I'm going to head out too, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.